in my defense, I decided I was going to change this recording last night. It's just, today I've spent most of my time dealing with estate agents, who are fun people to try and arrange a viewing uh, on houses that they apparently want to sell. And that their owners apparently want to sell. But apparently, they they want you to hand over hundreds of thousands of pounds and not actually visit the property in person. I disagree with this as a moral concept, but also I disagree with the fact of I'm, by genetic family history, half Scottish and half Cornish. We are not only bo both groups known as notoriously not liking to spend money, but not liking to spend money on something we haven't even been around is basically asking me to go through the version of my entire genetic bloodstream, leaving my body, forming a avatar of myself, and beating me up with all the spirits and powers infused of generations of generations of generations of past people who wouldn't want to spend that money. So, <clears throat> that's been my day. And it is with that emotion still in my body, I approach re-recording this, and I'm re-recording this because I think odd ship designs that actually work is a cool concept. And this is 12 ship design, odd ship designs that actually work, but there is something interesting in all of them. In that odd ships that actually work are usually odd because they don't look like regular ships because they're meant to do irregular jobs. Irregular roles. Roles we don't commonly see or commonly need but are actually there one of the things that I did consider putting in here was amphibious ships but they're not really odd we understand them, we know what they're, what they're there for, yes they don't look like regular ships, yes it's not normal to have holes in your ships which you can you know, have a little ramp which comes down off and float things in and out, that's kind of odd if you think about it, and it does work but that's not odd because Amphibious ships are generally far more understood. And so, odd to an extent, I've taken to mean for this video and for this discussion in both the live and the long patrol, to mean things which are unusual, which are out of the normal viewpoint, out of the normal discussion. That's kind of interesting, because there are lots of ships which are potentially out of the normal discussion. And which, if you're in the industry or connected with the maritime world, you might well know about. But the world isn't as connected. Humanity as a whole isn't as connected with the maritime world as it used to be. The maritime world is even more important than it used to be. But the percentage of population which has a strong connection with the movement of goods around the world by sea, the amount of trade which goes by sea, and the amount of information which goes by sea the number of people involved, actually involved in those industries as a percentage of population has shrunk dramatically. And as such, most of us rely on our definitions of what we see in movies and what we see maybe on the TV occasionally. And let's be honest, unless something's going wrong in the world, the maritime news doesn't make the major news. Which is strange when you think about it. When you think about all the trade that flows through the Suez Canal, when you think about all the goods that move all the way around the world on so many different ships, you think about how much of our life in the modern world is dependent on being able to move things from A to B to C to D, to the massive container ships carrying 24,000 containers. Which might be, uh, the ship might be flagged by one country, the it might be bringing the containers from three or four countries it's picked up on its route and dropping them off on another three or four countries, or it could be on a constant conveyor belt of moving goods between eight different ports, and those goods might be moving through one port or from one port from port A to port B or moving from port A to port F. They are, in many ways, conveyor belts, constantly moving around the world. And if, especially with just-in-time logistics, and especially with the obsession with efficiency, to the point to which I consider systems to be almost inefficient, 
because they have no slack in them. They have no ability to absorb problems or complications. Well, those ships being disrupted cause massive, issue, massive issues. And often when there are disruptions at sea, there are issues at sea, that's when odd ship designs are called in. When there are disruptions with, with things, when there's things need to be done which are outside a normal conveyor belt, the normal movement of goods, or when you need your warships to do something which is not what most of your warships are doing, that's when odd ship designs are called in. That's my theory, anyway. That's my idea for this video, and I hope you enjoy it. I really do. So, Tribals, Battles, and Darings. Now, it's thanks to this book, it's thanks to all your support for this channel, that I managed to keep doing all this history stuff, so thank you very much. And if you're interested, if you'd like a signed, personalised copy, well, there are two paperback editions, up to be one, on a link to the competition is down below. Hope you enjoy it. And yes, so as it's the year of the carrier, we're going to start with Easy and Huga. Now, here is the thing. Everyone experimented the idea of a battle carrier. I mean, everyone at least once thought, oh, wouldn't this be so nice? Only two nations really built them. One of them is Japan, with the conversion of these ships, and the other is the Soviet Union, with the uh, Kiev class. Let's be honest, the Kiev class are pretty much heavy missile cruisers with a runway flight deck strapped on the side. And they sort of work in a way, in and in a world where we allow and consider the Forger to actually work, the Yak-38. A whole interesting thing, which we got to later in the year of the aircraft carrier. Uh, the Forger. These in Huga, well, here's the thing. Here are the basic problems and the reason this one is odd. It does technically work, because aircraft can take off from it. They can't land on it, but they can take off from it. And it can still fire its guns, so technically, it works. In a very non-technical sense, it's actually quite expensive and difficult to run those ships. Uh, yes, they do provide you with eight 14-inch guns at this point, but they also provide you with aircraft, which apparently are reconnaissance and strike aircraft, which... I say probably to make the least sense for this one, because reconnaissance aircraft, if you're going to get the benefit of them, you're launching them on a regular basis. And you're recovering them. In fact, the whole reason the British ended up developing the full-length flight deck in World War One, and the, the reason they're working towards it and ended up developing it, was because of the need for reconnaissance aircraft and spotting aircraft. Basically, acquisition of information. Because the thing you really don't want to do in a contested area of ocean is stop your ship to have to recover an aircraft. Even slowing down and proceeding in a straight line, not good. You see, for a while when this is designed, there have been these vessels around the world called submarines. Now, I realise that they are not something we all know about, and I, I realise that it's not a common thing to discuss. But even the Imperial Japanese Navy, which spent a lot of time with the Royal Navy in World War I, had vicariously picked up through them and their own anti-submarine warfare operations in the Mediterranean World War I, where they had been some of the premier ASW specialists, had picked up a healthy dose of, um, what should I say, awareness of these vessels. They are a very special breed, after all, submarines. They... They are, well, I know the World War One, World War Two variety are mostly um, 
submersible torpedo boat, spending most of their time cruising around on the surface, because let's be honest, the noxious gas build-up in most of them, thanks to their batteries and their way they react with things, let alone their own engines and other chemicals put in them. It's brilliant for the crew. Uh, but leaving that all to one side, these are dangerous things. You don't usually want to slow down. You don't want to uh, keep moving in a straight line. Basically, moving in a straight line slowly is the easiest way to get killed by a submarine. I mean, I mean, you could stop completely, but that's just... At that point, you, you might as well just abandon the ship. I know, it's just easier. So, yeah, you don't want to pick them up. And secondly, what have you done with your battleship? Well, you've put a nice big juicy target on its stern, and let's be honest... When you're firing at a ship and you're firing in front of it to try and hit where it's going to go and it's moving, where do you think you're more likely to hit? Front or stern? Well, as they found at most battleship ranges, when you're doing it, more often than not, if you don't judge the speed correctly or if there's the slight angle differential, you're going to hit further back. And further back on this beauty is a nice pile of aviation fuel. And a lightly framed structure. That's what we all want on the back of our battleships. Because, let's be honest, once they become a smoking fireball on their stern, it makes them so much more difficult to hit. And these, of course, they chose fast-moving battleships, didn't they? They chose their faster-moving battleships for this. So they must be good high-speed vessels. Oh, no, they can do 25 knots. Okay, it's faster than American Standard Battleship. You have to give them that. It is faster than American Standard Battleship. But that's going to slow down the movement of your groups. Because the maximum speed they can do is 25 knots. And if that's your reconnaissance force, it's going to be out on its own. It's just... The, the whole scenario of choosing Ize and Higa for this is just absurd. Frankly... The Japanese might have been better off either completely decommissioning and cannibalizing them and using their crews for something else, or keeping one in service and decommissioning the other and keeping their crews in service. Because the big problem for the Japanese in World War II wasn't just having enough ships, it was having enough crew. There is a reason for this, which I'll get into more detail in the Japanese naval aviation video, but... Basically, it starts off with their crewing estimates and how their system runs. You see, whereas in other navies, they think we are going to have X number of ships in five years' time. So we need to recruit Y number of people to crew those ships and make sure we have enough people for those ships. The Japanese go, we have this many ships at this moment, so this is what we recruit for. And when they get to five years' time, when they have X many ships, that's when they start recruiting Y number of people. Can you see an issue? It means your recruitment lags behind. When you have a very selective, even, uh, even exhaustive, it could be said, recruitment process for officers, and a fairly hefty lead interesting one for sailors in order to get and make sure you get the finest and the best for the best this creates a lag for want of a better phrase in the system okay so basically the idea is this was going to give them reconnaissance capabilities Reconnaissance capabilities which were going to allow them to better assist the fleet in operations. It's a nice idea. It really is. But it was never going to work. And they look fairly odd because of it. And you could almost say they go from being quite nice looking ships with... Well, with a lot... Well, 12 14 inch guns and a lot more firepower to being sort of weird ships with eight 
14 inch guns. There's almost parts of me which would have preferred it if they got rid of the two middle turrets as well. Just left the forward turrets and given up all that length to a flight deck. Because theoretically, you could have developed something like a angled flight deck and had the equivalent of a full length flight deck. Theoretically. If you'd had it going across... Oh. oh. Um, yeah, going across the ship. It, it would have been highly interesting, but you could have turned it into something a lot better than it was. But they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to lose that much firepower, and they weren't sure it was going to work. And honestly, they're probably right... I really can see why it wouldn't work. In fact, most of me is sitting here thinking it won't work. And it didn't work. But it was a trend. But the trouble is, if this is the answer to the question, you have to ask yourself if you're asking the right question in the first place. Then we have the Ramform Hyperion. So, do you need to survey? Do you need to survey really, really well... Do you need to survey the sea so well that you guarantee you know what's down there, even below the seabed? My interest you in the ram forms. There is a whole class of them. They're all operated by the same Norwegian company. And they are amazing. You will see them every time there's going to be a major project. These are the vessels which are called in. If they want to service a, a survey an area for an oil field, for a gas field, for tectonic activity on an existing oil field and gas field, oh boy, these are what you want. If you want to check the seabed for something which you think you might have lost, you should probably call on these as well. Although they will cost you a lot of money. And to say they are probably overkill for what you want to do if you're searching for merely searching for a wreck is understating it dramatically. Um, they are wonderful vessels, but their entire shaping is designed around giving them the widest possible stern to deploy the most possible streams, so they have the most ability to get an accurate picture. They usually have them deployed in a, in a first line of eight, which are deployed out, and a second row of six, which come out behind them. And that's 14. Ships before this, some of them had two or three. 14. It's the equivalent of, I don't know, if you talk about towed sonar arrays, that's basically the equivalent of having 14 sonar arrays towed, away, towed behind you, if you're giving an example. And they have to proceed in a very straight line. They have to keep everything very accurate. And they have to be very, very correct about where they are. And they want to do their best also not only deploy those systems, but to be able to make sure they are not moved around while deploying those systems. So they can deploy them and proceed on as clear a course as possible. And this is why they're the shape they are. This is why they are this beautiful shape. This is why they look like they are an absolutely enormous ship which has lost its back three quarters. The Ramform Hyperion. Got that up. SBX. So, you want an X band radar? You want an X-band radar that can watch ballistic missiles and give you enough, enough tracking data that you can launch missiles to actually counter those ballistic missiles? Because let's be honest, the biggest problem with intercepting ballistic missiles is unless they are coming straight at you, uh, it becomes kind of difficult to be get enough data about their cross course in time to do an intercept. And straight at you or thereabouts. Well... This is the SBX. Believe it or not, it is self-propelled. When you want it to do long distance, as a rule, uh, you do send a uh, ship to go and give it a nice lift, and that's a, a dockwise vessel. I'll be talking about the dockwise company, etc., 
in a bit. In a bit. So I'm going to leave that particular vessel for later's discussions. But the SBX-1, it is what it looks like. They have taken an oil rig, a design for an oil rig which was pretty much self-propelled and able to adjust its position. And instead of building it with all the accoutrements of an oil rig, or a gas rig, they have instead put a massive great big radar on top of it. And it can see a really long way. For the price of roughly $900 million, so we all know that to build a current, uh, one version of it today would probably cost billions upon billions, the U.S. Navy slash the Missile Defense Agency slash various organizations which seem to work out of it um, have a radar with a range of roughly 2,000 kilometers or 1,200 miles on a vessel which displaces 50,000 tons. Well, 50,000 short tons, 45,000 tons regular. And its top speed is 9 knots, hence if you want it to do a long distance, you send something else to give it a lift. <laughs> it can do 9 knots. That, that, that's just not good. And it has the turning circle of what you would expect that to have the turning circle of. I mean, oil tankers look at it and go, ha ha! Um, but, no, it's fine. It's, it's a very, very good vessel. It's part of the ground-based mid-course uh, mid defense system of the Missile Defense Agency. And honestly, if you want to cover an area and be able to spot ballistic missiles coming inbound, this is a very sensible system. It spends most of its life between Alaska or Pearl Harbor. Again, fairly likely targets for such, a, a, such an attack. One would presume that Pearl Harbor should possibly have such a system installed on land as it's considering its value instead of needing to use the sea-based system but Alaska it seems rather sensible to have the sea-based system and maybe other places in the world should be covered by the sea-based system but you know there are economies of scale having one of these and moving it to whichever is the highest critical point guarantees it's probably going to be not to that point which gets hit because let's be honest you're going to aim your missiles where you're most likely to hit a target. But saying that, it's a good system to have. And honestly, systems like this really do make a lot of sense. They provide you with early warning. They provide you with some mobility, which is useful. Some strategic mobility that makes it more difficult for people to take them out. Either before or during an attack. It's far more difficult to take out something which is a moving target. And there's often various points made about people going, oh, we've got satellite coverage, we've got this, that, the other. A moving target is always more difficult to deal with than a stationary target. A stationary target, you can quantify, you can arrange your forces, you can organize, you can marshal, and you can go for it. A moving target you are not only limited in what is available the range to hit where it currently is or where it's going to be well by the time we get there you also have the problem of well we think it was there and now we we've lost track of it because our surveillance system has been jammed or has gone offline or someone has done something else nasty to it and so we're not quite sure where it was this is its last known position according to us now, I would say the other small problem for an X-band radar is that once it does activate and have to go active to actually be able to track incoming missiles, it is kind of the electronic equivalent of the sun, in that people are going to know where it is. Even long before it can detect them, people will know where it is, because it's, it's kind of a powerful visible signal statement but that's the brakes if you want the data you have to go active and if you go active you are going to be able to detect it a long way before you can detect them
still, it's useful. And definitely not a normal ship. Then we have the floating instrument platform, which is another cool thing which has been got rid of. I have to say, in the live, I did say I thought it was self-propelled, but it's not. It's always been towed by a tug, and I did admit that as well in the live. I'd got a mistake, but I, I, I always had the feeling it was self-propelled because it just looks like it should be. That you know, it's one of those things which looks like a James Bond watch. It's got to be stuffed full of gadgets. Why is it not self-propelled as well? The entire thing is to provide deep sea ocean graphic survey material to be able to conduct all sorts of experiments at sea. It's really not comfortable hotel facilities. Uh, that's what we tend to call for facilities for living aboard. And it was probably one of the most value for money acquisitions the US has ever made. Costing roughly $600,000 in 1962. Please note that it is being scrapped. They decided that they would um, forego giving it a refit, which would have cost $8 million. Now, I have to say, I have a feeling that this system, this unit, was of such great use that they will notice its absence, because... Yes, you can do a lot of things without using it. You can. But it was studying wave height, acoustic signals, water temperature, density, all the meteorological data important for oceanography and anti submarine warfare work. And when it set up, it provided unparalleled data in those areas. Now, yes, there are other systems we can use to gather those data than remote systems, uncrewed systems, all sorts of things. But the thing was, this allowed a lot more ready access and quick adjustment of gathering of data. I have a feeling this is one of those systems which, once it's gone... In about five to ten years, we're going to hear someone have a brilliant idea and they're basically going to be recreating it. I also have a feeling that the price tag is not going to be $600,000. It's not going to be $8 million. It's probably going to be about 2 to $3 billion. Because that's usually the way of things. It'll still be worth it, but we'll always know that it could have been so much easier and so much cheaper to just keep this going for another 10 years. <laughs> then we have Sukhov, representing the entire concept of cruiser submarines, i.e. let's put guns on them. Now, this is an interesting one because, again, with Sukhov, and I did mention this in live, And I found the actual book, but it's a fiction book, so I'm not going to name it, but it was fiction based on Sirkov, where they were discussing the Sirkov, and they said they could reload it from the inside. Now, it was a fiction book written just after World War II, but all the stats and all the official facts say it can't be. So I'm going to go with it can't be, but I, I did satisfy myself, because I, during the live I said, I thought it could be reloaded from the inside. And I was thinking, where did I get that from? So I went and tracked down through all various... Because, um, <clears throat> believe it or not, as well as collecting history books, I do collect quite a lot of very interesting, to me, fiction books from that period. And helpfully, the pile of them I had here to show you, I have moved. This takes skill to be this disorganised sometimes. And I have a few of those. And sometimes... Well, sometimes, interestingly enough, they give a good cue about what was going on in that period. They do give you a clue, because, especially if they're written by veterans, they will tell you things that aren't on the official documents. 
and then you go look at the official documents and you go, actually, that makes sense of these bits which are curiously written if I'm trying to read between the lines here of what they're saying, because otherwise these things didn't add up. But if I use this methodology, which is written in this particular work of fiction by a veteran who didn't serve on that vessel, but seems to have had quite a lot of stuff to do with that vessel, it makes a lot of sense. Now I have to go and actually find a relevant source which I can re reference, which will prove it. So again, in fiction, she can reload. Yeah, uh, she can reload her ready fire mm -hmm. stuff from uh, whilst underwater. Her ready to fire seems to is usually though all stored in various systems to protect it. So when she surfaces, they had to. Clear the gun's fraction. They had to get everything out. And this is one of the reasons why the circle took three minutes and 35 seconds to clear from action when she surfaced. Which is a long, long time. And she can only turn her guns, rather than turning the whole boat, under certain circumstances. And she can't really see that far. In fact, she's got 8-inch guns, but they're a lot limited in the range. If they used the periscope rather than the rangefinder, uh, they could aim their guns at targets up to 16 kilometers or 17,000 yards away. They're just using the rangefinder. They're limited to 12 kilometers or 13,000 yards. These guns that she's fitted with have a range of... 26 kilometers or 28,000 yards and that's a bit of a problem because this pretty much means that while she will technically outrange most destroyers when she surfaces she's a big big submarine surfacing it's going to be very difficult not to see her and this is remember not a daytime firing at night time she's not doing long range fires at night so she's going to surface. That's going to take time to actually break the surface and get up. And then once she's on the surface and set and in the position, three minutes, 35 seconds for her to be clear for action. And okay, you might shave a bit off that while moving stuff forward while you're surfacing. And so let's say it's going to be roughly four minutes of notification of her surfacing to her being able to fire. And if she's surfacing at a range that she can hit your target, so let's say she's doing the maximum range of 16 kilometers. And let's say the range of your guns are 12 kilometers. Well, let's think about that. Well, and that's the figure for the older uh, 4.7 inch guns for British destroyers, which were fitted quite widely to other ships. Well, your range is 16 kilometers. Their range is 12 kilometers. They're moving at 30 knots. They can could be up to 30 knots fairly quickly, yes, considering they're probably at cruising speed, so... Yeah, they can probably get up to 30 knots fairly quickly. But even if they were going at 18 knots, let's say, just kept at 18 knots, that's roughly 33 kilometers an hour. Or a little over a kilometer every couple of minutes. So it's eight minutes from you starting the surface to them being in range. And that's if they are sitting in the center of the convoy, and they won't be. In fact, they could be sitting a full fa a full kilometer outside the convoy, or at least 500 meters. And this is before we get on to the later versions of the uh, 4.7-inch gun, which had a range of 15 and a half kilometers. Let's consider that one. Again, if they're doing 18 knots, 18, remember this is not the 30, 33 knots that most destroyers could do, this is 18 knots cruising speed. They're not even increasing speed. Well, that's 500 meters and let's be honest, they're doing roughly 9 meters a second at 18 knots. If we're being nice, 
and I'm in the ch in the charitable and being nice. That's a minute before they're in firing range, and they are going to be in firing range and firing by the time that minute. You're still going to be loading and sorting yourself out. It's going to be another three minutes before you engage, and you've got two guns. They might have four, five, or six, or even eight if they're a tribal class destroyer. You now see some of the problems with cruiser submarines. And then people go, well, you know, they're, they're, they're supposed to go so uh, wandering around the world and take on independent loan merchant vessels. You're quite correct. They are supposed to take on loan merchant vessels. But here is the other trouble. Let's say that loan merchant vessel is capable of 12 knots and has, has a gun on it. Well, again, if it has the latest 4.7 inch gun, which quite a few of them were fitted with, some of them were fitted with the older 4.7 inch with modern uh, modernized mounting, so they could probably fire 15 kilometers. That's a single mount a mounting. They can quite possibly get in range. Yes. Let's say they're, they've got to do a thousand meters, but they're closing at six meters a second. And you're probably closing with them because the trouble is maximum firing range is not the same thing as accurate firing range. You want to be within the firing range as defined by your fire control system rather than as defined by your, your ability to stick your periscope up and see. And that's 12 kilometers. At that point, you're exchanging fire with a freighter. Yes, you might well win and sink the freighter, but you're a submarine. Your entire survivability, especially when you're a submarine this size, and you can do a maximum 18 half knots on the surface, is being able to submerge. You get damaged on your hull in any way, shape, or form. You ain't getting submerged. Do you see the problem? A cruiser submarine's major issue is that it's got an even bigger glass jaw than a surface radar. Okay? The whole problem for a surface radar, as the Graf Spey so brilliantly shows, is whilst it's undamaged and sailing around the seas, it is an absolute nightmare. The moment it's damaged and cornered, it's trapped. It's gone. It's just waiting to be killed. That's it. Well... A submarine as a surface radar, which is basically what they've done here. That's even worse. Because it's not even as fast as a normal surface radar is. And it doesn't certainly doesn't have the armor. And it doesn't have the firepower. And it's not as if this submarine can turn around and head away from the enemy while firing at the enemy. Uh, firing at the enemy. No. It actually will need to be probably pointing at the ship. And heading straight towards them while firing to be able to do that duty, to actually be able to hit them. In fact, so you might actually want to add its probable closing speed of roughly 10 knots to the closing speed. So if you end up with a closing speed again, well, that would be 22 knots the closing speed of between the merchant vessel going at 12 knots and the submarine. Oh, that's lovely. That's 11 meters a second. That's 50 kilometers an hour for a closing speed of 28 knots if the destroyer's moving at 18 and the submarine's moving at 10 towards the convoy. If the destroyer's moving at 30 knots, that's a closing speed of 70 kilometers an hour, which means the odds of you actually getting into practical firing range before you've been slammed by enough 4.7 inch or 5 inch or 4.5 inch or 4 inch shells that your hull looks like Swiss cheese is approximately zero. I mean, there's a chance it, or they all miss, but it's highly unlikely. And any one of those hits, you're in trouble. 
And this is the whole problem for these submarines. And the British test them out. Everyone tests them out because they're this wonderful idea because guns are more efficient than torpedoes space-wise to carry on a ship, on a, on a, on a submarine. You can't, you know, no matter how big your submarine is, torpedoes take up a lot of space. And they're very valuable. Shells are a lot cheaper to produce and take up a lot less space. It's a lot more efficient to kill people with shells than torpedoes. Or, or missiles. Still is to this day. They have longer ranges. They have more fancy techniques. They, you know, there, there are all sorts of things that are programmed into those systems. But if you want pound for pound, cost effective of being able to set a person within the same range, the shells are always more efficient. In space, in hull, everything. So it makes sense. It's just terrible because the moment you actually look into and actually think about doing it practically, and the only reason I think they get built is because everyone gets swept up with the idea, and I'll be talking about where the idea comes from later. And then they start testing them out, and then they become these national statements of prestige, the X class and the Surkov. The only people who actually do something good with large submarines are the Japanese with the I 400s. They have some good ideas. I'm not keen on the idea of a seaplane you have to assemble in order to go off and do reconnaissance. I really don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea for ships to stop and recover air aircraft. I definitely don't think it's good for a submarine to stop and recover an aircraft. But, you know, there are some really good ideas the Japanese do with the I-400s. And again, gear of submarine is going to be fun when it comes to that one. But, the Surkov and all the cruiser submarines, they're a good reason to drink something stronger than Iron Brew. Because, to a certain mindset, they they just so lovely. They're so attractive. They have, they're so efficient. And then you look at them practical and go, yeah. But if in even an individual merchant vessel has a good chance of actually killing you, you're in trouble. See, there's no scenario where a individual merchant vessel could run at the Graf Spey, or. Nisenau and Scharnhorst or anything like that and come out the winner. There is a scenario where a merchant vessel makes a run at the Surkov and comes out the winner. It might even come out still afloat. That's the reality. It might even come out still afloat because, again, ships are made to float. Submarines are made to sink. You poke holes in a submarine, it does what it does natural, naturally. You poke holes in a ship, you have to poke in enough to actually um, overwhelm its systems for survivability. Its damage control systems. Its anti-flooding systems. Then we have the Novogrod. Circular ships. Now again... These have so many wonderful ideas for them. They really do sound really cool. And these have what I can only describe as not just the joy of being circular ships, but also having what I will call simply as a compound engine. Now, this got into a discussion in the live, and so I'm going to go in, and there's a link to the live down below. Now, the reason I just called them a compound engine rather than a twin engine or twin compound or a triple expansion engine or a quadruple expansion engine or something like that is because they're not vertical they're a horizontal compound engine so they're horizontal compound engines rather than vertical compound engine uh, vertical expansion engines that you have they are horizontal that is as weird as it sounds and to the minds then, of course, they probably weren't weird because, you know, it's, we're trying it out. It's new technology. But honestly, there's a reason why you don't hear many after this period and why they disappear in favour of the vertical expansion. A, there's the whole efficiency in the hull scenario, but B, there's also the whole safety of the design scenario and its ability to work. So they, al they already have an interesting engine, and then you give them an interesting shape. And one of the problems with being circular 
is once you get caught by the sea and the currents and the winds, you can end up basically just twirling around. And you need to be a very skilled crew to prevent that happening. These vessels require a lot of understanding, a lot of knowledge of them, a lot of a lot of work with them to really handle them well. They are fine for rivers, very good for rivers, and estuaries, and being coastal defence ships, really, or rather literal defence ships. But you don't want to go out to sea in them. You just don't. But, yeah. Definitely an odd ship. And the Russians get really into the whole circular ship design. Because it looks, again, so efficient and could be so revolutionary. But it just isn't, because... The only really circular vessel which has ever really proved good is the Coracle. And let's be honest, they're not actually circular. They're sort of often slightly squash circular. And as anyone who's ever tried to get one of those little vessels to go through water, you do not proceed in a straight line. At least I didn't manage to. And I, I have tried on several occasions. I have managed to not get wet. I've managed to not end up flipping over. But it is... It's interesting. It really is interesting. Then we have the Grow class tracked torpedo motorboats. Now, okay. So for starters, you have chain tracks. And they're an interesting, interesting system in the, in the first place to think about. Choosing them, not rubber tracks, well, it probably depends on what's available and the technologies available at the time. And honestly, the ideas of what they could quickly get hold of to build. The whole idea was that these torpedo boats would not be stopped by geography. As you can see, they didn't really proceed with that, but they do offer an interesting idea of what might have been, if we consider if the Italians had continued on with this, what sort of things they could have been fielding in World War II. This is what they had in World War I, when the Austrians were frustrating them. It's amazing how navies can be motivated by frustration. Let's be honest, the entire Royal Navy doctrines, which I'm going to be recording and talking about this week, I'm going to be re-recording at some point today, probably again, uh, are entirely motivated by World, in World War II, are entirely motivated by the frustrations of World War I, and really do explain are explained a lot by the frustrations of World War One. With the Italians, they could see the Austrian battleships. They could smell the Austrian battleships. They couldn't reach them. And their torpedo boatmen wanted to reach them. They wanted them. They scented them. They tugged them. They desired to get them. And so these are what they build. They are noisy. They are slow. Trying to attack at night does not make it any better when you make that much racket. But still, they were built. Ah, Boca. Originally Dockwise Vanguard. Yes, this is what we all need in our life. We really do need one of these. Because, let's be honest, it is a semi-submersible heavy lift ship. And heavy lift ships are cool. Heavy lift ships are what are sent out when you have a large object or a ship get in trouble and you need to get it home. So, the USS Cole was brought home by the Blue Martin. Blue Marlin. I mean, I was gonna. I don't know why I called it Blue Martin. The Sir Tristan was brought home by the MV Dan Lifter. HMS Adelaide was delivered to Australia by the Blue Marlin. Again, often these ships turn up quite a lot. And one of the interesting things that's sort of worthwhile getting into when you're talking about these ships is how many of these vessels are owned by the same companies. Or rather, basically one company owns the vast majority of them and there's a few others owned by others. It used to be called Dockwise. Uh, now they're sort of an operating section of Boca. And I did have an interesting discussion in live, because I was just calling it Dockwise Vanguard and talking away about it, and the Dockwise company, and people went, no, they've been bought by Boca. They are now run by Boca, and I'm going, okay. Because I like the ship, I really don't care much about the company. 
But this particular vessel, now, the Vanguard, she is special. Because she can lift a hundred thousand tons, or well, a hundred and ten thousand tons. So she can carry if she wants to a Ford class aircraft carrier. Now, some people did point out they went, well, what about? You know, the various things on the hull, etc., and spacing. It would certainly be interesting. It would certainly be interesting. But I did do a little bit of digging in this scenario. And when I bring up the Ford class carrier, first thing I realize when I'm looking at its beam is it's 78 meters in terms of flight deck, but 41 meters at the waterline. And would you know it, the beam. The beam for the Bokka Vanguard. Well, she's 79 meters in beam. So, it's interesting. And then in length, she is roughly 275 meters. And the Ford class, they are 337 meters overall so there's overhang and all sorts of things involved in that so it would be interesting to see how they could if they could fit it on but i think you could i think it would be interesting i think it would be interesting but i honestly think you you probably could so basically this vessel has the potential that someday, if a Ford class or Nimitz class gets into trouble somewhere in the world and needs to actually be given a lift home, she, or potentially her sister, which is supposed to be being built, could be sent to pick them up. They are an incredible strategic resource for countries. And the fact that no country owns them, whereas uh, but only companies own them, and it's a very few companies own them, represents the fact that the economic demand for them in peacetime is not that great. But let's put this another thing, another way. Think about World War Two. Think about how many ships had to be abandoned. How many useful assets were lost. Think about how many ships which ended up having to be left in the nearest safe port were then decimated by the enemy because they couldn't be moved from there. Then think about having some of these around in World War II. They are arguably a floating dock which can move. Not quite the same attributes as a floating dock. But they do have some similar utilities. Ah, the K-Class submarine. So this is where the cruiser submarine comes from. Because the whole idea for the K-Class was we want to build a submarine which can keep up with the fleet. And then when we get into a fleet action, they will slip beneath the waves and decimate the enemy their torpedoes. And we will rule. You can just imagine the Admiral giving that presentation. The reality is, steam turbines and submarines do not mix. Not in this scenario, because it's an oil-fired boiler to power it. I know, with nuclear reactors, that's... some kind of steam turbine system, and I, I, I do realise that, but... For these, it didn't work. Okay, you have funnels, which, by their very nature, no matter how many times you try and seal them up, are supposed to provide... A system for and various other systems to allow air to go into the uh, into the hull and let the fumes, the exhaust gases, out of the hull when you've got the engines running. They do work because they can keep up to an extent with the, the with the fleet. They don't work because. The moment and people start realizing very quickly that actually coordinating submarines with surface ships and all this is an absolute nightmare. Even to this day, it is. Uh, you know, we often talk about 
carrier battle groups and modern task groups, including submarines. Coordinating between the forces is always an interesting task. Because fundamentally, the submarine is a very weird scenario. It's in the 3D world. Ships do move up and down because of the motion of waves and all those sort of things, but fundamentally they're moving in two dimensions. They can do that, and they can do that, 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 or that, that, that. So that's fundamentally how they control themselves. Submarines can do that, they can do that, they can do... And they have to, because whilst the sea can look like a flat canvas, under the sea is often a very craggy terrain. This means there are differences. There are differences in how they view the ocean, how they operate. And that leads to issues with cooperation between forces. But it's a nice idea. And it's something which things have got better on, and honestly, it's a significant part of modern operations is having your own attack submarine, usually with a task group, to provide reconnaissance capability in terms of being able to move closer covertly towards enemy forces or enemy areas to be able to uh, provide uh, some sort of first line of the capability against a enemy submarines, all sorts of things. But fundamentally, it's very rare you have more than one attached to such a group. And so, yes, traditional anti-submarine warfare systems of frigates, helicopters, and the helicopters uh, support uh, coming from the carrier, the destroyers, everything else, which is anything which is able to carry a helicopter and being queued in by the frigates. Yeah, that's going to be your anti submarine warfare network. That's fundamentally going to be it still. But it's an idea that came about before its time, can be argued. Ah, the next in Skagrak. Do you want to lay a lot of, a lot of cable? Do you want that cable to carry a lot of power? Well, you want to call the Nixon Skagrak. Because it will fix, if necessary, undersea cables which have been broken. And it will lay undersea cables if you need them. It's a one-stop shop. And it's a wonderful capability. And it's something which, again, we often think about today in terms of power. The sea is communications cables, but it's also power cables. There are all sorts of things which run under the sea today. In the ever more connected world we live in, if we really wanted to move to a, a green environmental world, well, one of the things you might want to figure out is having some sort of global power network that connects up not just one country, but multiple countries. Because that would allow you to be far more green energy efficient. Because there are some countries which are better producing wind power, some which are better producing solar power, some which are better producing at hydropower, some which are better producing nuclear power. Yes, I'm one of those people. I, I, I do think you probably need nuclear reactors and nuclear power in any future green power scenario. Definitely for the next 30 to 40, maybe 50 plus years at least. Current pace of technology sustaining, of course. And vessels like this are increasingly important. And they are probably not going to grow that much in number. But in terms of their strategic value, their commercial value, are probably going to grow exponentially. Because just as we link the world with undersea communication cables... I could well see us having to link the world with undersea power cables. Then we have the SMS Seedler. Now, the Seedler is a World War I surface radar used by the Germans. Now, when I did the live, I used this picture. And because the Seedler looked like this, without checking the flags... I know, I should have checked the flags, but I uh, was just using this as an illustration of what the Seedler got up to. It was actually running down ships. We don't think of World War II, or World War One. I, I mean, of having much Age of Sail sort of style of combat between sailing ships, but it did. Seedler was a good example. It managed to get out, mostly because of how it looked. This picture, 
I presumed this was the Siedler and this was the French vessel. But no, no, no. When you look at the, the flags, you realize this is the German vessel and this is the French vessel. And yet we know the Siedler was fully rigged. All the pictures of her that survive, all the drawings, the good ones, that survive, show her fully rigged. So, yes, this the artist has, I think, made some artistic choices. So, no. <laughs> it's interesting. But, yes, we don't think about this, but World War One, there were age of sail ships. There were ships going around with full, fully rigged sails, plying their trade on the oceans. And... She smashed herself up. It wasn't like she was caught. She managed to escape because of it. Because, unlike all the other ships that were going around time, she didn't need to go places to get fuel. She could just sail. It's a wonderful thing logistically, and it's one of the big advantages for her, was that she wasn't at the same threat as every other surface radar at the time. Because she could just sail around where she wanted to. It's an advantage, and she has a little diesel engine as well that can give her a bit of speed if she needs it, and a bit of movement. But mostly, she's a sailing vessel, and has the logistics of a sailing vessel, which means lots of food and lots of water to support her, her crew. And finally, we have possibly one of the most useful assets of World War II. Yes, this is USS Wolverine, who, along with her sister ship, the USS Sable, were instrumental in the training of roughly 17,000 pilots, landing signal officers, and naval personnel with minimal losses on the Great Lakes. They are paddle steam aircraft carriers. I kid you not. And the thing is, they allowed for these ships to operate without worrying about any enemy forces. Let's be honest, if someone managed to sneak, sneak into the Great Lakes the U.S. Navy was facing very serious issues, and the U.S. Army was probably facing serious issues. At that point, if someone manages to get a Japanese submarine or a German submarine into the Great Lakes, I'm fairly certain the list of people who would be getting a visit from Admiral King, let alone President Roosevelt, would be quite long and painful. So, these vessels steam around the Great Lakes, and the aircraft are just landing and taking off, landing and taking off. And so all that training can be conducted pretty much without any worry about any other operations. There's no escorts being needed. There's no worry about supply tankers. There's no need to do all sorts of things on these ships. And so you can really get a volume of training going through. But even beyond that, beyond that, you can do a volume of reliable training. You can throw all sorts of different decisions and conditions at them. And this makes it a very strong, very viable service. This is how you expand a navy under wartime conditions. When you couple this with the British and American practice of withdrawing veteran pilots, people who have served, their t uh, served some time, a couple of tours, with the frontline squadrons, to come be instructors, to train up the pilots. And you have this. By the time you get pilots, new pilots, going to their squadrons, they're already quite well trained. They're already quite viable. And then they go into a squadron where there are a mixture of veterans and themselves, and they, they learn by working with them, by observing them, what to do, and you raise up a very capable whole force. Wolverine and Sable are a key example of why the U.S. Navy gets to have the naval aviation capability it does by the end of World War II. Because it's able to build them up using them. Because they have that facility. And they're just cool ships. They really are. You know, The idea of a paddle steamer carrier just tickles me in so many ways. It does. The fact that they worked as well as they did is just cool. It really is. I know, I say cool a lot, but... <sighs> they are. 
side wheel paddle steamer. Just the whole idea of it being the uh, having the latest in technology of aircraft carrier at the time and being critical to all the developments of all sort of innovative high tech ideas on its top on its flight deck and then you go down below and it's a paddle steamer just capable of a top speed of 19 knots so that was a good vessel they were good they were useful just they're special they're really old anyway there's no question today because frankly I think this entire topic should generate enough discussion without me having to um, me adding a question and I couldn't really think of a decent one but we're on Tuesday it's going to be the British World War II carrier naval aviation doctrines pre-war two war I not cannot remember what the live is on Thursday but I do have it written down somewhere thank you very much for watching I hope you enjoyed thank you very much to everyone who's liked the video because if you like the video please do like there's a button down there YouTube tells me off if I don't say also, if you would like to see more, please subscribe. Apparently I don't do that enough, I don't mention subscribing enough, and I'm going to keep mentioning videos until YouTube stops snagging me about it, because I'm starting to get a complex over it. And if you'd like to support the channel, well, that was the book. <laughs> but also there's membership of the channel, which gives some very cool emojis for when you're in the chat. There's Patreon, where you're able to suggest topics for the lives and vote on topics for the lives. And there's also Kofi, because some people just like to buy me some iron brew, because they realise that I'm more iron brew than water or blood at this point, and frankly, I needed to stay alive. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you're having a nice day.